In just six years, Dubai achieved what nature would take millions of years to do, creating a massive man-made island that can be seen from outer space. In an area of sea where no island had ever existed, hundreds of millions of cubic meters of sand were dredged from the ocean floor and precisely shaped using satellite technology, turning what were once considered impossible designs into solid land capable of supporting a luxury resort city worth tens of billions of dollars. To the world, it became a symbol of ambition, speed, and modern engineering. But as the construction was completed and time began to pass, serious questions started to emerge. Why did Dubai turn away from the desert and move straight into the ocean? Let's explore. Dubai's transformation into a global city happened in remarkably little time. It was once a small fishing village along the Persian Gulf, with an economy almost entirely dependent on fishing and the pearl trade. More than 95% of its land area is arid desert. Average annual rainfall is only about 100 millimeters. Arable land is nearly non-existent, and natural resources are extremely limited. The turning point came in the mid-20th century, when oil was discovered and rapid growth began. However, unlike many other oil-producing countries, Dubai quickly realized that its oil reserves were not large enough to sustain long-term wealth. Beginning in the 1980s and 1990s, the city shifted aggressively toward trade, finance, logistics, and tourism, with the goal of becoming a global hub. In just a few decades, the population grew from a few hundred thousand to more than 3.5 million, driving massive demand for living space, infrastructure, and high-end real estate. But with desert covering nearly the entire territory and a natural coastline far too short to match its development ambitions, Dubai was forced to confront a hard geographic limit. And from this history of limited land, scarce resources, and deep reliance on the sea, a bold idea began to take shape. If there wasn't enough land, Dubai would create its own. The idea of creating land from the sea was never limited to a single island. From the early 2000s, the city's leadership envisioned a far larger plan, building an entire ecosystem of artificial islands offshore capable of reshaping the coastline and redefining how the world sees Dubai. In 2001, the master plan was announced with four major projects. Palm Jumeirah, the first island and the boldest test of the concept. Palm Jebel Ali, nearly twice as large, intended to become a new coastal urban district. Palm Dera, the most ambitious, planned to be the largest artificial island in the world. And finally, the world, an archipelago of roughly 300 small islands designed to replicate a world map on the surface of the sea. The objective behind this plan was clear. Beyond simply expanding land area, Dubai aimed to double or even triple its natural coastline, creating dozens of kilometers of prime waterfront, the most valuable asset for tourism and high-end real estate. At the same time, the shapes of these islands were designed to be instantly recognizable from satellite imagery giving Dubai a geographic signature unlike any other city on the planet. If the entire artificial island program was a single big picture, Palm Jumeirah was the very first piece and the decisive test of Dubai's ambition. The island stretches roughly five kilometers in length, surrounded by a crescent-shaped breakwater nearly 17 kilometers long, with a total area of about 560 hectares. The palm tree shape was not chosen just for symbolism. With a central trunk and 16 fronds, the design maximizes beachfront exposure, turning each frond into a waterfront corridor, while also allowing ocean currents to spread out rather than concentrate force on a single point. But geometry is only what's visible on the surface. What truly determined the survival of Palm Jumeirah happened below the waterline. The entire project operated like a massive industrial production line. The inputs included roughly 94 million cubic meters of sand, dredged directly from the seabed, and more than 7 million tons of rock used to build the foundation and breakwaters. Construction began with controlled dredging, guided by satellite GPS to place each load of sand with precision. This was followed by vibro-compaction, a technique used to densify the sand, increase load-bearing capacity, and limit long-term settlement. Encircling the island is a multi-layered breakwater system designed to absorb and dissipate wave energy before it ever reaches the reclaimed land. 
The result was not simply an island floating on the sea, but a stable foundation capable of supporting roads, utilities, and multi-story structures rising dozens of floors above the water. Once Palm Jumeirah had taken shape, Dubai's engineers were no longer facing a construction problem, but a survival problem in the open sea. The area is regularly hit by waves measuring two to three meters under normal conditions and far higher during winter storms. Coastal currents constantly move sediment, strong enough to reshape shorelines within just a few years if left unmanaged. In that environment, using concrete and steel, the familiar materials of modern cities, would have been a risky choice. Rigid concrete surfaces reflect waves back toward the sea, concentrating energy and accelerating erosion at the foundation. Steel, when exposed long-term to salt water, faces electrochemical corrosion and decades of costly maintenance. At the scale of Palm Jumeirah, maintaining rigid structures alone could have cost hundreds of millions of dollars per year. Instead of trying to freeze the ocean in place, engineers were forced to change strategy. Beneath the surface, the artificial sand foundation, tens of meters thick, was densely compacted to support heavy loads and resist subsurface erosion, allowing the entire island to move within controlled limits rather than crack under the pressure of the sea. On this man-made island, a fully integrated urban ecosystem gradually took shape, from transportation infrastructure to high-end resort spaces. Palm Jumeirah is connected to the mainland by a road bridge approximately 1.4 kilometers long, along with a monorail system carrying more than 20,000 passengers per day, in addition to a six-lane road tunnel running beneath the sea. Life on the island is closely tied to luxury real estate, by the early 2010s, Palm Jumeirah was home to more than 30 luxury hotels, capable of accommodating over 25,000 guests at any given time, alongside approximately 60,000 residents living in apartments and villas. The total value of real estate on the island is estimated to exceed $30 billion, with waterfront apartments priced from hundreds of thousands to tens of millions of dollars, while villas located on the palm fronds, each with private beachfront access, typically start at several million dollars. The infrastructure is designed to support an almost self-contained lifestyle. Shopping centers, upscale restaurants, marinas, private beaches, and entertainment venues are all located within just a few minutes of travel. Palm Jumeirah also quickly became a familiar destination for the global ultra-wealthy and celebrities, not only because of its luxury, but because it offers a private island experience in the middle of a city of more than 3.5 million people, where every square meter of space is measured in time, convenience, and privacy. Beneath the glossy image of Palm Jumeirah, Dubai's man-made island story is not defined by success alone. As the ambition to expand into the sea grew larger in scale, the harsh limits of economics and nature began to surface. Palm Jebel Ali, a project nearly twice the size of Palm Jumeirah, was halted after 2008 when the global financial crisis caused demand for luxury real estate to collapse. Tens of millions of cubic meters of sand were pumped into place, but most of the above-ground infrastructure was never built, leaving a man-made landmass that remained almost frozen for more than a decade. Palm Dira, the most ambitious project in the entire plan, was forced to shrink and undergo repeated restructuring as maintenance costs proved too high once capital flows slowed. With the world an archipelago of roughly 300 small islands, the challenges were even greater. A lack of infrastructure connections, no permanent residence, and complete dependence on ongoing dredging and reinforcement, costing tens of millions of dollars each year. It was from this point that the idea of sinking islands began to appear in the media. The islands did not suddenly disappear, but erosion, localized subsidence, and sediment movement have been documented in areas without regular maintenance. At this time each year, Iron Bridge once again faces rising river levels. The River Severn flows directly through this small village, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but in recent years, Iron Bridge has no longer been paralyzed by flooding after the Environment Agency began deploying the geodesigned flood barrier system along the Wharfage Road. Whenever there is a risk of flooding, a temporary barrier stretching up to 550 meters is quickly installed, forming a highly effective defensive line. 
The entire system is pre-packed in metal cages, making it easy to transport and deploy when needed. Well-trained technical teams can assemble and dismantle the barrier with increasing speed, precision, and efficiency. First, the support legs are positioned at staggered heights, then raised and locked into an upright position. The supports are leveled using shift plates to compensate for uneven ground. Next, metal panels are mounted and secured onto the supports. A poly liner is then laid in front of the barrier folded over the top and fastened with clips. Finally, chains are placed along the outer edge to press the liner tightly against the ground, ensuring a watertight seal even on uneven terrain. The presence of the flood barrier has had a clear impact on local life. Riverside pubs, hotels, and shops continue operating normally during the rainy season, while homes remain safely protected from rising waters. Flooding a home or business is one of the worst experiences any family or property owner can face. That's why a company in Ireland has developed the Floodgate Dam Easy System, a portable flood protection solution designed for fast deployment, simple operation, and installation without any permanent changes to the building structure. The system is built to stop flood water from entering directly through doorways and can be set up in less than five minutes. To use it, the user simply removes the barrier from its protective case, places it at the base of the doorway, and adjusts the width to match the opening. The side panels are then expanded using a ratchet hand wheel until they press firmly against the doorframe. Next, the ceiling gasket is inflated with a hand pump to a pressure of about two bar, creating a tight seal that blocks all gaps and prevents water from getting through. For locations that require extra protection, the system can also be used with adhesive reinforcement, pads for the door frame corners, as well as a security metal plate that locks onto the barrier, making it extremely difficult to move or tamper with from the outside. Floodgate is flexible enough to be used on residential doors, shop entrances, commercial properties, and garage doors, making it suitable for a wide range of flood scenarios. Once the flood water recedes, the user simply opens the air release valve to deflate the gasket, retracts the side panels, and lifts the barrier out of the doorway. The unit is then cleaned, folded, and stored back in its protective case, ready for the next use. With its simple yet effective design, Floodgate provides a practical, lightweight, and proactive flood defense solution for areas that regularly face flooding risks. While residential areas are often the most visibly and directly affected by flooding, large cities with dense infrastructure are actually the most critical hidden weak points. For this reason, many cities around the world have begun adopting self-closing flood barriers SCFBs, as a passive yet highly effective line of defense. SCFBs operate on a unique principle, using water to fight water. Under normal conditions, the system remains hidden beneath road surfaces or inside technical channels, causing no disruption to daily life or traffic. When floodwaters arrive, water flows into a specially designed intake channel and fills an internal chamber within the system. As the water level rises, it activates panels or floating elements that gradually lift the barrier wall up from the ground. This entire process happens fully automatically. No electricity, no complex sensors, and no human intervention are required. Notably, as flood water continues to rise, the pressure of the water itself becomes a reinforcing force, pressing the barrier more tightly against the ground in rubber seals, making the system even more stable and watertight. When the flood recedes, water drains out of the chamber and the barrier lowers back down by gravity, restoring the original surface without the need for dismantling or manual resetting. When properly deployed, SCFBs can effectively protect critical infrastructure such as power plants, electrical substations, data centers, subway entrances, and urban basements. These are locations where even a single flooding event can cause massive economic losses, disrupt the lives of millions, and potentially threaten lives if failures occur during peak hours. Not all flood prevention solutions are massive walls built to block or redirect water. In many cases, the most effective approach is to manage water right where it falls, before it has a chance to cause flooding. That is the idea behind Top Mix Permeable, a special type of permeable concrete designed to support urban drainage systems. Unlike conventional concrete, which is solid and impermeable, Top Mix Permeable has a porous structure. Its surface layer is made of relatively large aggregate stones bonded together, 
creating thousands of tiny gaps that allow rainwater to pass through the concrete almost instantly. The water then flows down into the layers below, where it is temporarily stored and gradually released into the underground drainage system. A typical top mix permeable installation consists of three main layers, the permeable concrete surface on top, which directly receives rainfall, a base layer beneath it, often made of porous rubber or crushed stone, that acts as a temporary storage reservoir and a supporting drainage system that carries the water away from the protected area. On average, each square meter of top mix concrete can absorb up to about 600 liters of water per minute, an especially impressive figure in dense urban environments. Thanks to advanced compaction and material bonding technologies, top mix permeable is strong enough to withstand the weight of vehicles, making it suitable for use on city streets, parking lots, and residential driveways. Dubai's man-made islands are not only engineering marvels, but also a clear reflection of the limits of human ambition. Palm Jumeirah proves that land can be created from the sea, yet the unfinished projects surrounding it reveal a harsher reality. Construction is only the first step. Long-term maintenance and operation are the real challenge. Caught between success and risk, Dubai's artificial islands have become living laboratories where vision, economics, and nature constantly collide. If you enjoy stories about engineering and bold mega projects like this, don't forget to like and follow Mandarin Tech for more journeys ahead.